So, um, hello everyone, welcome to our event this evening. It's a beautiful, beautiful day here in Sacramento. I'm sorry if you're not from here and you're experiencing snow because we had a, an absolutely gorgeous day here today and there were lots of people out shopping. Uh, safely for COVID, of course, yes. Um, my name is Heidi Rojek, and I'm the owner of Capital Books in downtown Sacramento. Um, I'm, I'm here to um, excitedly host Kate Washington. She's a Sacramento author and a food writer who uh, cur currently serves as a dining critic for the Sacramento Bee. Um, her work has appeared in many publications, including the Washington Post, Eater, Catapult, and McSweeney's Internet Tendency. Um, she is the author of Already Toast, which is a book about how care, being a caregiver is all consuming and how it can run you to the ground and um, how to navigate that and recognize it. Um, she is going to be um, interviewed by uh, Ray, I hope I don't butcher your name, um, Ray Guriand. Did I get that right? No, but nobody <laughs> who is you the it? speaker does. It's Guirant. Sorry. Um, <laughs> she's going to be interviewing Kate, and I'm going to act as your MC for the evening. Um, as I mentioned, I'm really excited to have Kate here today. Um, not only did she begin writing this book pre-COVID and, and it was about being a care, caregiver uh, for her really ill husband and how women tend to get pigeonholed into that role and um, men can too. Um, but it's, it's an exhausting role to have. Um, but I, I thought that it also was um, relevant in this day and age of COVID and homeschooling children and everybody working at home. And a lot of the times women have gotten um, the, the role of uh, taking a step down or a step back from their careers and having to um, help children in at-home learning and or daycare because we all lost that um, during this last year of COVID. So um, I think her book evolved into covering more topics than what you originally even wrote it for, which is kind of exciting that um, it, it's, it's probably become, gonna become like a history book after this. <laughs> So um, the other announcement I wanted to make is that um, Kate has um, gener generously provided a gift certificate to Grubhub for one lucky winner for this evening. And the reason that she chose Grubhub was because um, probably many of you watching this broadcast are a caregiver right now. And um, not only needing to hear Kate's words during this next hour, but also you could probably use a break in having to cook a meal. So um, at the end of the evening, I will be randomly picking one person to, um, to receive this gift from Kate. Um, I will be, um, as soon as I get things going here, I'm going to put in the chat the link to purchase Already Toast if you haven't already. We have it available at the bookstore. Um, copies are selling quickly. Um, if, if you don't see one available on our website or if you come in and we don't have it, more are on the way, I promise. Um, we also, if you live in Sacramento, um, locally to the bookstore, we, um, we can also deliver the book if that's easiest for you. Um, if you're not from around here, we do um, shipping all over the nation. So don't hesitate to, um, to support a local bookstore because we sure appreciate it. 
So with that, um, any questions you have for Ray or for Kate, please put it in the chat and uh, we'll get to that at the end of the event. So welcome Kate. And I'm going to toss this over to Ray now. <laughs> and here I'll catch it and toss it right back to Kate because we're going to open with, uh, with Kate reading a little selection from Already Toast. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming. I'm really excited to see so many faces of people I love and new friends that I have not yet met. And it's wonderful of you all to spend your Saturday evening here uh, a year into Zoom fatigue. So thank you so much for making the time. Um, I'm gonna put on my reading glasses, so hopefully the glare won't be too bad, but I promise I'll take them off again after. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna read a short section from near the beginning of the book. Um, this section is called Lazy Cancer, and it is about getting the initial diagnosis of my husband's lymphoma um, after kind of a, a long lead up of seeking a, um, seeking a diagnosis. Um, it begins with a reference to a holiday party that we had that felt like kind of the last normal the last normal party that we did as a family. And uh, it's possible that a few of you might have been there. Um, so I'll read now. A few days after our big blowout 2014 holiday party came a message sent to Brad's online health portal. It was a result from the biopsy. We both felt anxious, hearts pounding as he logged in. The result, however, was inconclusive. No cancer cells had been found, but the sample was too small to rule it out. The report in its dry medical jargon recommended a core biopsy rather than a fine needle one. In other words, more limbo, more tests, more uncertainty. We went on with our Christmas, the cracked Dungeness crab and sourdough bread for Christmas Eve, the girls in matching pajamas, presents the next morning, but unease cast a pall over all of it. The girls didn't notice. We had decided not to tell them until we knew something for sure. Brad went back to the hematologist oncologist he'd been assigned to, and this time I went with him to ask about the plan. The core biopsy was ordered. We waited and waited and waited. Finally, in late February, results came in. Brad indeed had a blood cancer, a type of lymphoma so rare, the doctor said that it didn't have a name of its own, just a string of markers. We didn't need to know those, the oncologist said. It was too long. I've got a pen and a lot of patients, I said, try me. With obvious reluctance, he said, there is some ambiguity, but we think the best way to describe it is as an indolent non-Hodgkin peripheral T-cell lymphoma, not otherwise specified. Then the, came the string of cell markers. Not otherwise specified is a catch-all term for a group of rare lymphomas. Indolent meant it was thought to be slow growing. A word about lymphoma, there are more than 70 types, each with its own distinct treatments and prognosis. And here I go into uh, some details about lymphomas that I will skip in this reading. In general, T, -cells lymphoma, T cell lymphomas are not as well understood as others and are harder to treat, in part because their rarity means there are few clinical trials or opportunities for double blind studies. I was, of course, Googling madly for all the information I could find about rare lymphomas, treatment options, and what to expect. In this way, the early stages of caregiving played to my strengths. I was good at research. I liked finding out information, and I was an AMA planner. Learning what we were dealing with, determining next steps, and acting as an advocate, while also supporting Brad emotionally. All of this was scary, but didn't seem onerous. With my pen and notepad pushing the oncologist for more answers, I could feel like I was in control and succeeding at this new job. I didn't realize how hard it would be later as the glow wore off and the challenges ramped up. Brad's oncologist assured us that because his disease was indolent, it was not particularly urgent to treat it. Some of the most common forms of lymphoma never require treatment or turn dangerous, he said. The plan for now, he said, was watch, wait, and research potential treatment options. He seemed reluctant to treat it all. We left the office. We joked that Brad had lazy cancer. I still wasn't thinking much about what it might mean to care for him. Of course, I knew his cancer would affect our lives, but at that point, it was still possible to be in denial about how much. The weekend after the diagnosis was the fifth anniversary of my mother's suicide. My in-laws were in town visiting and we drove to my hometown for the day. 
I'm close with my brother. Hi, Pete, I see you here. And on the anniversary of our mom's death, we try to get together. Late February also happens to be when the almond trees in Northern California are in bloom. So we often meet up at my dad's almond farm for a picnic during what's usually a small break of spring-like weather. Brad was tired and coughing a lot on that day trip. We went to my brother's house where the girls played with their younger cousin. Brad lay down on the couch, wrapped a blanket around himself and nodded off. I looked over at my mother-in-law and there were tears in her eyes. He looks so sick, she said. I, it feels like I'm looking into the future. She shivered. I saw her point. He was pale, crumpled, gaunt, a harbinger of worse times to come. Brad's oncologist was of the old fashioned type and seemed unsettled when we pushed back on the let's not do anything plan. He finally, reluctantly, offered a plan for chemo with a drug more commonly used as a second line treatment. Our insurance denied the claim on that ground. Brad and I had many agonized conversations about that. I remember discussing potentially paying for it out of pocket, even though nobody was particularly convinced it would be effective. We asked for a second opinion at Stanford Brad's didn't quite fit their specialty, but they were interested in his case. He was, we were already learning, that unlucky patient to whom doctor after doctor would say, we've really never seen this before. Stanford wanted to run some additional tests, including a bronchoscopy, running a camera into Brad's lungs to see why he might be coughing so much. Looking back, it's unclear to me why nobody ever suggested a PET scan, PET scan the gold standard for cancer detection. Brad was known to have tumors on his jawline and abdomen and lymphoma is a systemic cancer. If I'd known then what I know now as the caregiver, I'd have fought tooth and nail for a pet, something I've had to do on occasion since then. But I was still naive and still not fully accustomed to acting as a patient advocate. So we waited. I remember that Brad's coughing increased in severity that spring. With some trepidations about whether we should travel far from our usual medical care, we took the girls to Hawaii on a spring break trip we'd planned before Brad's diagnosis. A friend who knew about the diagnosis, but whom I hadn't seen for a while, later told me that when she saw our pictures on Facebook, she wondered if it had been the kind of trip you take when everything's about to change. We hadn't planned it that way, but it was absolutely that kind of trip. And that friend who asked me that was in fact Ray. And so I will <laughs> turn it back over to her. Oh. Thank you. My God, I was listening to you and just thinking about, I mean, it's been, it's been so long now and yet this time, it's been both an infinity of time and it's gone by in a second. I can't believe that that's almost, it's just over six years ago, going on seven years ago this coming fall, right? Yes. Wow. <laughs> so um, I've had the pleasure of seeing the pages of this book come to be um, over many years now. And I have had the distinct pleasure of watching them transform from, um, from in the moment material to retrospective and reflective material to, to argument. Um, and I don't know that it's that common for other people to necessarily have such intimate relationships with other people's manuscripts as they're becoming. Um, so it's been really fun for me to, to prepare for this event and to think about the book and to think about the kinds of questions that, that we could talk about that would be interesting to folks who haven't read the book, who may know you personally or have a particular interest in caregiving, but who don't necessarily have the, um, the same breadth of um, of, or perspective on the manuscript that I do. It's just, it, this is a really wonderful occasion. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so happy to be participating in this. I want us to start by talking about how the writing of this book was sparked. Um, because I know, I remember so well that like so many books that, um, that I have watched being written over time, um, that it was actually born out of acts of reading and out of rereading, um, that that was really so much in its genesis. And I wanted to see if you would talk about what it is that, um, that other books had to do with setting this one in motion for you. Yeah, I'd love to talk about that. And thank you. For those who may not know, um, Ray is a writing teacher and workshop leader. And so I've workshopped sections of this book in 
in her workshop and was in it at the time of Brad's illness. So that's how she came to see a lot of it unfold um, so intimately. Um, one of the th ways that it did unfold, and I should clarify, you know, I was a writer before I was a caregiver, and I'll keep being a writer <laughs> um, for my whole life. And I've also been a reader for my whole life and a really passionate reader. And during the real intensity of Brad's illness, I found myself going back to kind of comfort reads, things that I had loved as a children, as a child, Little Women, um, the Anne of Green Gables series, uh, Victorian novels that were my focus in graduate school, but that I had, you know, liked to revisit. So things that felt like solace. Um, and there's a strong literary thread that runs through this book that I've written because what happened when I returned to those um, classics and old favorites was that I started to notice caregiving figures kind of in the shadows. And I'd never really thought about caregiving in classic literature, even though it's there. And particularly in the Victorian period, most people were caring for family members at home. That shows up in books in, in Jane Eyre, you know, infamously there's a woman trapped in the attic and being cared for by a paid caregiver. In Middlemarch, there are instances of illness um, where people have to make tough choices about how to care for other characters. And so as I kept rereading those, different elements of the plots and the characters' dilemmas around caregiving kind of spoke to my own experience, which at the time I was feeling quite isolated and was feeling like I didn't have a lot of points of connection um, you know, with other caregivers. Certainly there are a lot of resources online to connect people and I, I have dear friends who I met through caregiving um, that became important touchstones, but you know, it's very lonely work a lot of the time. You know, a lot of caregiving takes place behind closed doors in private and, you know, reading does too. And reading into situations of caregiving was an experience that kind of turned me toward them. And some of my first published material that has made its way into the book um, was considerations of the caregiving that I was reading about in literature um, in kind of stolen moments. I didn't have, it wasn't like I had a lot of time to hang around and read, but um, the reading that I was doing, I was starting to see that theme in places I'd never really noticed it before. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll note here, in case anyone's curious, that I happen to know that a good number of those essays are all linked on your website, yes? Are, yeah. so if yes. anyone would like to read them, they are there for the finding, and they are all gems. <laughs> um, let's do a little vocabulary lesson. I'm assuming since the book just came out this week that it's possible I'm the only one here besides you who has read the entire thing. No, Brad, of course, has read the entire thing. I don't know if anyone else has. Um, but just in case, uh, as we continue to talk, um, some of the terms that, um, that come into the air are unfamiliar to people, or it would be in case it would be useful for them to hear you talk about them through a caregiving lens specifically. Um, burnout, a word that is in the title of the book, already toast, caregiving and burnout in America. How would you describe burnout, Kate? Um, well, the reason burnout is in the title is because it's really common among caregivers and it's something that happens when people are taxed so far in their, in particular in my framing, in their capacity to care for other people that it just fizzles out past their, you know, their ability to empathize, their ability to continue to cope. Um, burnout really robs people of the emotional capacity to keep going. It's a state of, you know, being already toast as it is in the, in the um, title of the book. And I should explain that that title comes from me taking a quiz on caregiver burnout. This story is told right at the very beginning of the book, but I came home from a tough doctor's appointment and Googled for resources, but found a quiz on caregiver burnout. And when I checked all the boxes at the end that this result popped up that was like, you're already toast with like a smoking piece of bread. 
um, kind of blithely telling me that like I was past where I could continue kind of effectively to to care for somebody. Okay. Um, second term, invisible labor. This is a big broad one that I thought quite a lot about and I think it's a hot topic these days. Um, it can en encompass everything from the mental load of running a home, childcare, domestic work. Um, I've seen the term emotional labor used for this a lot. Um, memory work, social, fostering social connections. It's a highly gendered um, kind of set of roles that make up invisible labor. I chose invisible labor in the hopes that it would incorporate all of those things, not just you know the emotional piece of or the you know the work of picking up the socks when nobody else is noticing or you know weeding out the things from the clutter from people's houses to donate, you know, it can be all of those things, all of those tasks that any one of them doesn't seem very big, but taken together, they make a huge, huge uh, load of work. Okay. Um, third one, I imagine probably we all have our own relationships to this term by now because it has been popularized, but I feel like you say some really interesting things about it in the book that are particular to your perspective. Um, self-care. Yes, that is a, a term that I think has gotten, you know, a lot of currency during the pandemic and before, um, has become really commodified in a lot of ways. And it started out with really um, radical roots for self-care for revolutionaries, which I would never, you know, claim to be, and protesters from Audre Lorde. And um, it was the idea of, you know, tending to yourself and making space to continue to flourish for yourself. And then it, you know, it, as many things do in our capitalistic society, got kind of picked up and commodified and now is sold back to us as, you know, manicures and, you know, buying girl boss merchandise or something like that. And I think that it's really important to think carefully about what we're, we're asking and prescribing with a notion of self-care. Um, I think the truth kind of for most people lies somewhere somewhere in between. Um, for me as a caregiver who is spending a lot of time on caring for other people, I found being told to focus on self-care really challenging because it felt like a to-do list item. Like, mm -hmm. oh, I've been caring for other people. Like I do not have time to care for myself. Um, and I also think that that self-care is often prescribed when what we all need is community care or like societal level care. And um, one of the things that was really important to me to incorporate in the book was sort of a broad systemic critique of how caregiving and unpaid family caregiving in particular uh, operates in our culture. And I, I should say also, while we're on the theme of definitions, when I'm talking about caregiving, um, it can have a lot of meanings, but for me, I'm specifically applying it to caring for an ill uh, family member or friend, um, usually an adult. Mm -hmm. um, last one, vicarious trauma. Yeah, this is a this is an interesting uh, term that comes from um, really medical care and trauma work. And I adopted it and, and talk about it some in the book, in the, especially in the context of post-traumatic stress. Um, caregivers can pick up a lot of, you know, are not being directly traumatized, but can pick up a lot of what you would call vicarious trauma, being traumatized by being in this difficult, painful, stressful situation. Um, and having that reverberate through and after the experience. So there's been some research done showing that um, the trauma of caregiving can really linger, can, can cause um, ongoing symptoms of stress. That's of course very true for you know, the ill person who was being cared for as well. Um, you know, there's tremendous trauma and strain associated with that. Um, and research now is kind of showing that that can carry over to the caregiver as well. 
thank you. Um, so one of the things that I think is a really valuable message in the book um, is just how the, the cost of caregiving can evolve and change for the caregiver over time. Um, of course, as you're telling the story of the particular situation from um, diagnosis through treatment and on into um, recovery and the new normal for you and for your family, um, you, uh, you narrate a progression from an acute emergency um, to caregiving over the long term. And one of the things that I feel like I learn a lot about from the book is about um, how it is that a role that initially can seem quite clear can actually gain or lose definition in different ways over time. It's one of the things that the book really makes me think a lot about. Um, and I was wondering if maybe you'd like to talk a little bit about how it is that you would describe the, the cost to the caregiver being different over time from the beginning to the ending of a caregiving cycle. Um, and what, what you would say about, about coping um, and about methods for coping and for managing burnout. Yeah, that's a, a big question. I think it's multi-pronged to think about the costs of caregiving, as you suggest. Um, I will kind of bracket and set aside, because I think we, we may touch later on this as well. There's um, very significant economic costs. One of the things I uncovered in my research is that um, caregiving can really um, be a huge financial hit to caregivers and families. And I'll kind of bracket that and talk a little bit more about the emotional costs and the kinds of caregiving. Um, you know, there's kind of, there can be the short, sharp shock of being plunged into an emergency situation, which, you know, is very challenging, but also comes with a kind of adrenaline burst that I think keeps a lot of caregivers going for the early stages. Um, and then can be kind of a oh, deflating or, you know, difficult experience when that ends. You know, many, many people end up being in caregiving roles for years or decades. You know, since the book came out, I've heard from uh, many caregivers, and I'm sure there are many of you in the audience as well, who, you know, have been in caregiving situations with people in very long-term with very long-term illness, long-term declines. This can particularly be the case with dementia caregiving. And that the kind of slow grind of that, I think has a, a long-term long cost. And it's really important to guard, you know, what time or what space you can as a caregiver. I think that the longer the experience goes on, the more and more challenging that is. And I, I'm really wary of, at the same time of saying like, well, take breaks because that is obviously not always accessible. And one of the reasons I wrote the book is to make the kind of systemic critique of like, why aren't those things accessible? Why are there such severe economic costs for families and individual caregivers who are just trying to do the best they can for their loved ones? Why is there not a broader system making that possible? You know, why is it up to us as individuals to look out for our interests, you know, and, you know, find the time to take the walk or get the night away? You know, that is something that you know, society needs to kind of step up and, and offer to, to keep those costs lower, because it can, it leads very quickly, I think, to, to burnout. And another thing I, I wanted to call attention to in terms of you know, long-term emotional cost is I was very fortunate that my caregiving situation, which has very much eased as my husband has regained, you know, functional independence, though he is still chronically ill. Um, for many, many people, care a long and draining caregiving journey then ends in grief. And that can be really hard to come back from. You know, you're plunged into mourning and grief. 
at, especially after a long and really difficult, um, you know, experience with caring for the person. And I think it can be hard to process that because often the instinct is to, to move past after a really, really hard experience. So I, I wanted to point that out and that, you know, that I'm fortunate it was not my experience in caregiving, but can be an extra strain on the individual. Um, so we got together last week. Uh, we have seen each other since the beginning of the pandemic, how many times? Like maybe three times? Twice, I think, yeah, to, to know three, yeah. Three, I think. At a distance. Um, and uh, and when we saw each other last week, we got to talking a little bit about, um, again, about the evolution of the book and about um, about the shape that it's come to now as a kind of hybrid memoir and work of of cultural criticism of soci socio cultural criticism, um, and we also talked about some of the the particular challenges of writing a story that is not a unique story um, and uh, what it feels like and what it means when you get to the point where you realize that the story that you are telling that is so much bound up in your individual experience um, connects you actually to, um, to many, many others. So I wanted us to talk a little bit about that, um, about what it's like to, to write a book that that reaches in that way, that bridges between those ki two kinds of writing um, or those two kinds of discourse and, uh, and just what your thoughts are, are on it now, now that it's out. Finally. Yeah, <laughs> and that's, that's a great question because it was really important to me that this book not just be a memoir strictly of my own caregiving experience. Um, I, I don't think that would have that much to teach anybody who was not a caregiver in similar circumstances. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I learned in my research is AARP does a lot of demographic work and research on caregivers and their most recent survey concluded that there are 53 million Americans caring for an adult friend or family member who needs assistance. So yeah. there are 53 million other people out there with a story, if not the same as, analogous to mine. And there are many, many, many more grueling caregiving tales out there. I'm sure many of you in the audience have family experience with challenging, you know, with the challenges of caring for somebody you love. And what I really started thinking about was this tension between the individual and the broader society that I think in the United States, our culture really leans toward individualistic explanations of everything. You know, problems are the individuals to solve. A family care crisis is the families to work out and not toward bigger systemic solutions. And I wanted my book in some ways to be a protest against that, that, um, that would show how we need to integrate a, a systemic analysis as well as an individual story. You know, my, my story, what I hope it will do in the book is illustrate the urgency just in one small way of a bigger problem. And I, sh I should also say that I felt like I was, you know, I was a very privileged caregiver. I had a lot of family help. Um, my in-laws were with us for a very long time, providing assistance that we probably, I probably would have like drowned without that. Um, you know, I had other family help. I had friends, many of you who are in the audience who dropped off meals and offered to run errands and like the community, you know, did step up and help me, you know, I, and I think that on a broad social level, we need to replicate that <laughs> that act um, to help all caregivers. And so I wanted the narrative of my book to bring all of those strands together and try to make that argument in a broader way that spun out from my own individual experience. 
um, you just started uh, in the direct in a direction that I was going to ask about, which is um, what what if anything you were particularly surprised to learn about caregiving um, statistically or otherwise, either in the United States or globally um, during the phase of writing that had you um, really broadening into research and thinking from a more systemic perspective? Yeah, um, well, I'll start by saying when the thing that I was most surprised by as an individual caregiver and then give a couple of statistics and bigger facts that surprised me. What I was most surprised by as, a, as an individual caregiver was just how much medical work the medical system expected me to do at home with almost zero training. There were things where it was like, oh, he's coming home on IV antibiotics, so you'll be learning today in the next 15 minutes how to administer those. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like, I don't know how to do that. And it was terrifying, you know? And it was like, I might introduce bacteria into the line, you know, it needed to go in a central line. And that's a fairly low level task compared to what many, many family care caregivers are asked to provide to their loved ones every day. Um, and to provide to really vulnerable, ill people. And so I was really shocked at kind of the care gap that family members were expected to fill up um, you know, and that was something that I've seen, you know, I've, I'm actually seeing some nods as I talked about that in, in the audience. And so I sense that many have, have experience with this, but until it's kind of put on you, you're, it doesn't really, it didn't really occur to me. And I, I thought like, well, they'll send a nurse. They do not send a nurse. You become the nurse. <laughs> and in terms of, um, bigger surprises or things that I learned. Um, some of the economic statistics really shocked me, particularly the, um, the impact on women caregivers. And I should say, you know, my, my book takes a deliberately kind of feminist analysis, um, feminist lens on the problem. Bet depending on the analysis, 61 to 75% of caregiver of family caregivers are women. So I'm not trying to discount the contribution of men, which is significant, but it, it is disproportionately female. And I would argue that the devaluing of care and the undervaluing of care generally is connected with its connection with femininity, like that women's labor is kind of expected to be free in these in these uh, situations. And that that has negative effects for both female and male caregivers. Um, an immensely high proportion of family caregivers have to reduce their hours or leave their work entirely. Um, women who have been, been family caregivers and had to reduce their work hours are 2.5 times more likely to live in poverty in old age than their peers who were not family caregivers. And that was one statistics that statistic that really leapt out at me because it's, it's not just, oh, like you lost a few years of income. It's losing paying into social security. It's losing out on pensions and salary increases. And it is a lifetime economic effect mm -hmm. that can, you know, kind of rob whole families of, of the opportunity to build wealth. So leaping into the future, um, I was going to ask the question, where do the solutions lie? It's not enough words <laughs> for, um, for the biggest question that I feel like I could ask, but that's the best version of it that I, that I could bring into focus this afternoon when I was um, rereading the book and preparing for this conversation. Where do the solutions lie? In what directions do they lie? You know, I think um, you could look at it two ways. You can look at it as needing a culture change that can drive policy change, mm -hmm. or you can look at it as needing some policy change that can drag the culture along, kicking and screaming into kind of a better way of treating people. And I, I tend to think, especially right now when the pandemic and issues of care are such prominent issues that we have a window of opportunity for some of the policy change that would really help support caregivers. Um, 
and and support other people besides just care caregivers. Um, I look at really like three particular areas. Um, the most obvious something that is unbelievably overdue and that is shameful that we do not have is universal paid leave mm -hmm. for family caregivers and and sick people as well you know but the fact that the united states does not have paid leave and that we have essentially made no federal progress on this issue since the 90s and the clinton era and the passage of unpaid family leave is pretty shameful and we should really be changing that it was originally there was originally um paid leave in the coronavirus relief bill and it, it fell out unfortunately mm -hmm. but that's a, a policy provision that would make a world of difference to people because it would you know guarantee em employment and offer other you know protections along those lines um i think that some form of economic compensation for caregivers is really important that exists in patchworks and through medicaid for um, caregivers who are at the who are more economically challenged it does not really exist so much for um for middle class caregivers but there are proposals for tax credits um i personally would love to see some kind of direct pay program which i favor over tax credits because it doesn't require you to have income to claim it but mm -hmm. i think anything would be a step in the right direction and um i would also point to a forms of universal basic income could be really helpful here the i mentioned in the book toward the end there was a experiment with ubi just down the road from us in stockton california um that some of the the results have just come in and some of the results really point to people being better able to take care of their loved ones with that extra margin in the case of Stockton, it was $500 a month, you know, and people were spending it on family care, spending it on ways of making their lives better and making the lives of their ill family members better. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would also say, and this is, you know, we're talking pipe dreams here. So these are really, <laughs> these are big, big uh, things, but um, universal health care, um, you know, in the US without universal health care, families are vulnerable caregivers spend an inordinate amount of time just arranging for care. And it makes for um, a lot of vulnerability and instability for people who are ill, for the people who are caring for them. It leads to bankruptcy, it leads to worse outcomes. And so that's, you know, a broader look at health. And I also, I also think that if there were universal care, there would be fewer of those care gaps that I talked about earlier, more integrated care, more possibilities for getting people help when they need it that does not 100% rely on, uh, on just, um, you know, caregivers filling in the gaps. I saw a question pop up that's a really good one that I'll address that are there models for this in other countries? And the answer yeah. is yes. <laughs> other I countries sure are... saw that question because I wanted to ask that one too. Yeah. Other countries are, are looking at this, tackling it, doing it better. Some states are bringing in new policy changes. The state of Washington has passed um, some, some measures that are relief um, Japan is a really interesting example in that it's had to contend with the aging of its population much earlier than we have, and they've um, piloted some really um, innovative programs, including like a system of caregiver credits where people can help people and then swap them for their own loved ones if they don't live near the loved ones. I talk about this in the conclusion to my book, um, but there are also, you know, all the countries with a social safety net are doing um, some version of some of the things that I that I just spoke about. Sarah Peterson asks, has a copy of Already Toast been sent to the White House? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Sarah. And not that I know of, but I'll tell my publicist. <laughs> Um, there's a question from Esther Chapman. Can you talk more about what you learned as a caregiver, as a caregiver about advocating in the healthcare system and how do caregivers 
learn that skill besides learning it the hard way? Yeah, I definitely learned it the hard way. Um, you know, I really, I really tried to, you know, go in there and look professional or, you know, if not professional, at least kind of put together and be somebody who was trustworthy and have my notebook and try to get that respect so that I would seem kind of like a partner to the physicians and not seem just like some lady who was along for the ride, right? Like, cause I think there's a lot of, um, for me, I encountered a, a lot of being taken for granted as like, you're here to do the things that need to get done we are just going to tell you what those are and you're going to do them and that was that was unstated you know and pushing back was challenging like it's hard to push back against a whole big system um brad was being treated here in sacramento at uc davis medical center and that place is a bureaucratic maze it's a teaching hospital which is great and like which provided us with a lot of access to amazing care and it was also incredibly hard to figure out like, who is the hospitalist? What do they do? It turns out the hospitalist is the most important person for you to know about on the, you know, on the unit where your husband is staying because they decide who gets discharged when. And like, there's all these critical things, but like, for me, it was really important to find a nurse or somebody who was friendly and get the like, walk through and, and try to, try to figure it out but one of the one of the things that I talk a little bit about in the book and that I I really think is that we need more proactive caregiver education there need to be more social workers more patient navigators more people doing outreach um, to make that learning curve for new patients and new caregivers less steep because it, it is very intimidating you're entering into a vast unknown system. And it's it can be really hard to uh, get to the courage of speaking up. I am, I'm just monitoring the chat. I saw a question from Jana who would love to hear you talk about the process of weaving the research into your personal story. Oh, that's, that's a great question. I, um, I had a big, I wish I could turn my monitor and show you guys on the wall, but I've, I've now taken it down, but I had a huge like wall size schedule for writing the book when I wrote it. And what I did was I had a lot of personal writings that I had been doing through the int most intense parts of Brad's illness, sometimes which were just kind of diary entry stuff. So before I ever, before I wrote the book proposal, um, I had kind of a backbone of the memoir material. And a lot of that was really rough, um, not something that, you know, I would have used in the book the way it was, but it formed kind of a, a narrative arc. And when I sat down after the book was under contract and I was sitting down to like really produce the draft, I ended up getting all of the pieces of writing that I had produced during all of Brad's illness and the time leading up to it and my book proposal. And I made a giant outline in like a folder tree form on my hard drive. And for those who are not interested in writing craft stuff, I'm sorry, I will go through this <laughs> part quickly. And so each, each chapter had a raw materials folder that was sometimes just like, you know, paragraphs and paragraphs that I was go going to stitch together. And then I wrote the book in order chapter by chapter and had a plan and outlined and like put those pieces in together. Some of the writing that I had from the early days was also based on a blog that Brad and I originally jointly kept. And then as he got really ill um, during his stem cell transplant, I was just keeping it. And it was for um, communicating with family and friends during the most intense parts of his illness, because one piece of caregiver labor that I did not talk about before is the labor of keeping in touch with family and friends and keeping them updated, which is, you know, necessary, but can be a, you know, a very time consuming 
and also draining part to you know restate things and answer questions. So we we kept a blog with the information and updates on how he was doing. So I had kind of a I had kind of a chronological um, piece. I see a chat that came up and it said and emotionally exhausting. I'm like yes, emotionally exhausting for sure. Um, so I had those writings. I had kind of rant ish writings that I was working with. And then I, I did the, um, the research as I went through the writing process and just tried to tie everything in together. Um, you know, I was doing it piece by piece as I went on different themes and trying to weave those in and out without keeping, so that each chapter had a balance of the personal and and the research material. And then there was kind of a third strand as well, which was the, um, the literary material and analysis. And I didn't want, I didn't want anything to read like a chapter of my dissertation, you know, where it was like all literature, but I did want to have those, um, those strands threaded through. So it was kind of a, just taking it, taking it chapter by chapter and, and trying to, to slot those together. And then there was a major revision after that, that first time. So I got a second crack at it and a plate, um, a time to see like, oh, here the balance is way off because it goes on for pages and pages about statistics and you need to get back to the story, kind of, <laughs> so. I just noticed a good, I think it's a good follow-up question in the chat. At what point, um, at what point during this journey did you decide to write a book? Was it a way to process what you were going through or did you always know that you also wanted to write an advocacy or policy book? I did not always know that. <laughs> um, I think it. I think it evolved out of the writing that I was doing, and also it evolved out of looking for a book like this. <laughs> um, I wanted, in in some ways, I I wrote the book that I needed to read when things were really hard. Like I wrote the book that I hope will help other caregivers feel seen and help them feel validated, especially in the like hard and challenging emotions, which are often kind of smoothed over and glossed over in popular narratives around caregiving. Like if you think of movies about caregiving that come to like a sentimental conclusion or something like that, the there's kind of this nobility and um, sense of, you know, so noble self-sacrifice and that it's a, a virtue. And it, it absolutely can be a noble self-sacrifice and it's also hard and people are going to experience negative emotions around something that can be such a draining role. And I think that, you know, a lot of people need to feel seen in that. And, and I also need, felt like I needed to look at like why it was so hard and think about, um, you know, what are the ways that people aren't being supported and kind of raise a voice for that uh, you know as i as i started to emerge from the intensity of you know really difficult caregiving um i realized that one of the reasons that this issue is a little bit under discussed despite how very many people are caregivers is that caregivers are largely too busy to make a big like public advocacy statement about it. You know, there are some great organizations working in this space, but, you know, most people who are caring for a family member and especially the ones who are the most burnt out and the most stressed by it are not gonna have time to organize a March on Washington or call their congressperson every day or do other kinds of organizing that can affect policy change. And, you know, I'm, I'm not, a I'm not an organizer, but I can tell a story. And that is what I tried to do to help, you know, give voice to this issue. I don't know, I would argue that telling a story is a one way, um, one way to think about organization. Stories are organization. Um, I'm just looking for more questions in the chat because I know we're getting we're getting pretty close to seven o'clock here. Uh, could you talk about the language of illness and care? 
Yeah. Oh, hi. I see that that is um, from my friend Lisa Jenkins in Australia. Hi, hi, Lisa. Thank you. Lisa is uh, zooming in from the future tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that um, I see uh, Lisa mentioned the talk of pain as a battle. And I'll kind of focus in on that a little bit because I think the military metaphors and the idea of the fight around care and illness can be really damaging for people. I, I adopted a little bit in the book when I talk about feeling like collateral damage as a caregiver, but I also tried to you know have some distance on that and critique that language a little bit at the same time because I, I think it is a, um, you know, it can really be harmful for people to frame, you know, an illness as a fight. It's not a fair fight. It's not, it's not a thing where you have like an enemy that you could defeat if you just try hard enough. And it really does a disservice to people who are suffering from, um, suffering from a condition to talk about them as if they lost a battle with cancer. Um, you know, it's not something you can win by trying harder. And, you know, caregiving also is not something you can necessarily win by trying harder. I think there's a lot of things we can kind of re-examine in the language that we use casually around care and illness. Um, I had a piece a couple of weeks ago in Time Magazine talking about the language of positivity mm -hmm. around, around care and illness, you know, the kind of like, you gotta stay positive. Like everything happens for a reason. Um, I don't know if any of you have read Kate Bowler's great book um, called that everything happens for a reason. And then the subtitle and, and is another lies that nearly killed me. I think is, I think I'm quoting that right. But there's a great scene in there where her husband, somebody comes to the door, like bringing them a casserole and just says, everything happens for a reason. And the husband looks at him, looks at whoever's bringing it and is like, so tell me the reason, like, what's the reason that my wife appears to be dying? Like, there's not a good reason. Um, and I think that thinking critically about, you know, some of those language choices can be one way of affirming both caregivers and the ill, you know, ill or disabled people that they're caring for. Oh, I have been corrected and other lies I've loved. <laughs> <laughs> I conflated it with something else. My apologies. <laughs> I see a, another question. Do you think that caregivers have difficulty feeling entitled to help? Why? Yes, I think that can be hard. It can be really hard to accept help. And it often was for me. Um, and that is an area I maybe could have examined even more in the book is like, you know, we have, we do, as I said before, have this individualist cult culture where, you know, we're supposed to be standing on our own two feet and, um, you know, doing things for ourselves. And it, it can be hard to reframe that and accept kind of community networks of help, relinquish control and um, ask for what you need. You know, it's, it's not easy to like reach out to somebody and be like, I need you to go to Target and get me the sheets that we, you know, whatever the example might be, you know, but sometimes you need a weird thing and you really need help. And, you know, now that I'm not in the most intense period of it, like I want to provide, you know, help to people and give, you know, a little bit of solace where I can. And it, it can be, it can be challenging because caregiving often seems like a closed system and um, also if you've been entrusted with the kind of knowledge base and the, the specifics of medical care that I talked about earlier, that can feel really risky to, to relinquish or to let that go as well. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of challenges around, around that. Um. Heidi, do we have a link in the chat somewhere that will help people buy the book? Yeah, I, I put it earlier, but let me uh, paste it again here. Okay. Um, I also have a, uh, whoops, a winner. Let me do this the right way to everybody. There we go. Um, the winner of the Grubhub 
randomly selected by me by closing my eyes and scrolling, um, <laughs> Melanie Madden. Yay, Melanie. So Melanie, if you could privately message me on this chat here, your um, mailing address, I will pass that on to Kate and um, then uh, uh, she'll get your gift certificate off. So hopefully Melanie you, is still on here. Let me just verify that here. So I picked yeah. that 10 minutes ago. Yep, she's there. Who's there? I, I wanted to, if I if I could just answer one more question because I scrolled up a little bit in the chat and I saw a great question that I would love to address from Naomi Williams, who is another Sacramento author who is wonderful. And she talked a little bit about um, you know, that I acknowledged privilege in the book and talked some about how um, the burdens of caregiving can fall disproportionately, not just on women, but particularly on women of color and more marginalized groups. And I would love to address that because the research really shows that that is very much the case. And that can kind of fall in two ways. First of all, that marginalized families um, with less access to care and fewer resources are much, you know, are disproportionately economically harmed by some of the really difficult challenges of caregiving people in, um, you know, jobs where they have to be present in, you know, and essential workers are much less likely to be able to juggle um, the demands of caregiving alongside their, their work life and thus are more likely to lose employment because of it. And then also um, paid care work, which we haven't really talked about tonight, but is an important piece of like the general problems of undervaluing of care of all kinds, like professional paid care work in the home um, is often a really unstable employment. You know, we we employed care workers when Brad needed 24 hour care and was at home and it was not covered by insurance. So we were paying directly out of pocket. And, you know, those, those um, jobs tend to be very disproportionately done by women of color, immigrant women, often non-citizens um, and there are very few employment protections from them. So I want for them. So I wanted to address that, um, that question because I think it's a really critical piece of the general question of how care operates in, in our society. Thank you for letting me <laughs> jump back on that soapbox. No, no problem, no problem. Um... Well, thank you, Kate. It, this was really informative. I, I uh, enjoyed it a lot to, to hear this. Um, not, not only as a woman, I, I was not, I've not had to be a caretaker other than a mom, but um, my husband had to be a caretaker of me for a while there when I, I had a series of MRSA infections that they just kept cutting more and more out. And when you had mentioned that a lot of times caregivers um, suddenly become nurses and physicians assistants. And he found himself in that role of, you know, having to do stuff that no person should ever have to do with, you know, open wounds and all that. So um, I'm sure that he had a lot of that caregiver fatigue um, and we're, we're over that hump now for now, but um it, it's a very real real thing for men and for women. So I'm really glad that you wrote this book about it. So well, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm you know so grateful to all of you for coming. It's great to see so many names and I'm sorry I didn't get to like shout out everybody individually, but um, I'm you know so touched that you've all been here and asked such great questions and shown up on your on your Saturday night. Thank you. Congratulations, Kate. Thank you. And thank you, Ray, for, for uh, interviewing. I, I really enjoyed your very um, laid back and comfortable style. <laughs> it's Thanks, Heidi. You might be the first person to call me laid back or comfortable my entire life long. <laughs> <laughs> <I enjoyed> <laughs> All right. So uh, if you happen to be from Sacramento, pop on over to our store. We've been open. Um, pretty much since COVID began, but in a very limited capacity. And um, it's been really nice to see um, 
more Sacramentans um, out and about now that we're in the red tier. Um, we're still uh, obviously requiring masks in the store and we, we actually don't let any more people in than we have been since um, probably uh, early summer, last summer. So, but um, uh, certainly enough people to shop the shelves and it's always fun to visit a bookstore. So if you're local, come on in, we'd love to meet you. So um, that concludes our Saturday evening. I thank you guys for joining us. I'm, I'm really uh, glad to see a, a nice crowd here for Kate. Thanks, Enjoy the rest of the weekend. So and anyone who would like their copy signed if they get one, if you're oh, local. Right. Yeah. And if you're not local, I have these little like book plate stickers that I can sign and pop in the mail for you, which I would love to do. So they're the cutest. They have the little toast imprint on them. <laughs> so, <Very cute. laughs> so you can message me on social media or email or wherever. And uh, yeah, and all the copies one. that we get into the store, Kate will be coming in to sign them before yes. they go out to you. So, all right. Well, have a great Sunday, everybody. Thanks, Heidi. Bye. -bye. Thanks so much. I want to see faces before people sign off. Uh -huh. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Kai. That's my nephew. Uh huh. I know that face. <laughs> Hi, buddy. Did he just get a haircut? <laughs> Looks like it. Yeah. Hi, Brad. Hi, Ray. Thank you so much. Oh, happily. I think I just saw Lucy or Nora behind you. Yeah, Lucy has been uh, hovering uh, throughout with great interest. <laughs> Hi, Lucy. <laughs> Hanging on every answer or just showing off. I can't tell which. <laughs> and thank you, Heidi, for um, oh, you're welcome. for hosting. Yeah, these are always fun to do. I, I look forward to in-person events coming up soon. I, I think we'll probably be able to start those in uh, the summer again in limited capacity. Yeah, so that'd be nice. I think a lot of people are pretty zoomed out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to end the meeting. Right. Thank you. Thank okay. you so much, Heidi. I really appreciate Bye, it. Bye. Bye.